I would like to introduce our distinguished speakers now. First, we will have Dr. Raj Pruthi, who is currently Chair of the Department of Urology and Professor of Urology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill School of Medicine. He received his medical degree from Duke University and completed residencies in general surgery and urologic surgery at Stanford University. His clinical and research interests include urologic oncology, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and prostate cancer. He's published in over 120 peer-reviewed publications in these areas. His clinical interests include minimally invasive treatments for urologic malignancies, including laparoscopic and robotic technologies for radical surgical procedures. Second, we will have Rachel Wong, who is an oncology dietitian at the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. She's worked as a clinical and outpatient dietitian at the George Washington University Hospital and Learner Health and Wellness Center. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Connecticut and a public health certification from George Washington University. Um, first, we'll have Dr. Pruthi, and we'll transfer the slides over to you now. All right, thanks, Vanessa. Are, are this, are, can you see the slides okay? Um, I'm doing it right now. Okay. You should a little notice on your screen. Okay. And Perfect. Okay. There we go. All right, well, well uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about nutritional deficiency in the bladder cancer patient and effect, effectively focusing on our emerging understanding of this over the last few years. I'll talk specifically, more specifically, about invasive disease in patients undergoing surgery and chemotherapy, but I think these concepts are really applicable to all bladder cancer patients. So bladder cancer is the fourth most common cancer in men, the uh, 11th most common cancer in women, overall about seventh most common cancer, with about 75,000 new cases per year. And this incidence has been rising over the last several decades, likely due to our aging population and the latent effects of tobacco abuse. So about 25% of these patients will be have invasive disease, and another fraction will also have non-invasive disease that will progress or recur and also need radical cystectomy, which is our gold standard for these patients and a very effective operation from the cancer oncologic standpoint. The problem with radical cystectomy is that the 90-day complication rate is about 64 percent, so it remains a relatively difficult procedure for a patient. And I want to show you an example of a patient that, uh, an anecdotal case of a 70-year-old male who presented to us with bladder cancer and noted on his history to have a bad taste in his mouth and some weight loss in the preceding months before his surgery. He underwent surgery, and his post-operative course was notable for uh, some wound complications, some problems with infection, a readmission. Upon readmission, a prolonged length of stay with some gastrointestinal difficulties and the need for IV nutrition, something we call TPN, uh, until he was discharged. And the question is, that exists is, is, was this inevitable, or could this have been prevented with a more thorough preoperative evaluation and intervention? and particularly an intervention that focuses on malnutrition and nutritional aspects. Protein energy malnutrition is a common problem in hospitalized patients. Almost half of the patients undergoing any kind of medical or surgical procedure will have a level of malnutrition. And these factors, preoperatively and postoperatively, are important uh, risk factors for developing complications, such as the complications we saw in the 70-year-old man. Malnutrition causes tissue wasting, impaired muscle function, and what we call sarcopenia, which is a term used and a more commonly used term for wasting of the muscle, delayed mobilization, and even effects on the lung and heart function. In particular to surgery, nutritional deficiency, especially in the general surgical population, has been well-known risk factor for a variety of complications in surgery patients, including infections and wound healing in addition to mortality. And several studies, so, so we know that it's impacting the patients and their outcomes. But often in this day and age, people want to know, uh, well, what is the economic impact? And unfortunately, this is the reality of where we are. Well, malnutrition has an economic impact as well. 
prolonged length of stay, increased costs are also associated with malnutrition as well. So important uh, patient-related events, certainly, as well as economic events that go along with it. Urology is actually very exceptional, and exceptional maybe not in a very positive way, but exceptional in the fact that many of our patients are going to be at risk for malnutrition. A patient undergoing a cystectomy, many of them are over the age of 70 years. Many are undergoing major surgeries. And if you use some of the uh, assessments, I'm going to go into this a little bit later, but they have, we have these surveys, these instruments to evaluate for malnutrition, and one of them is the NRS 2002 tool. So if you use that tool, automatically a 70-year-old patient undergoing a cystectomy, just by being 70 and by undergoing major surgery, has a risk score of greater than 3, which puts them at a risk for malnutrition right away, irrespective of the other factors. You add in malignancy, bladder cancer, and automatically this patient is at significant risk for malnutrition. So we're identifying that, but only recently are we really getting our hands around it. However, over 30 years ago, about 30 years ago, a group at University of Alabama showed in about 69 patients that they did a somewhat rudimentary evaluation by today's standard of malnutrition. They looked at white blood cell count, which measures immune function, and albumin, which is the protein in the blood. So these are imperfect tests, but at the time, you know, served to measure nutritional depletion. And they found out in those patients who had nutritional depletion, there were 75% of them had severe complications. So the first association that patients who are malnourished don't do well in cystectomy. Things really remained untouched for about 25 years in our field, until most recently. A couple of years ago, Greg and colleagues showed that about in their cystectomy series, about one in five patients, 19%, were nutritionally deficient by their criteria. And the 90-day mortality between those who are nutritionally deficient versus non-nutritionally deficient, that being you know, uh, more whole with their nutritional status, uh, th over three-fold difference, 16% to 5%. And if you look the survival out further, 44% for nutritionally deficient, 68% much better with a better uh, nutritional status. I mean, this is a difference of 24%. And to put some context to that, when we do surgery for bladder cancer, cystectomy, we'll, some, we'll, we'll often give chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery with the hopes that the average improvement is about 5 or 6%. So you compare that 5 or 6% to this 24%, you see them in a very impactful, important role that nutritional deficiency has. A couple of recent studies out of our own institution show that by Johnson, about 1,000 patients, over 1,000 patients, cystectomy patients, and albumin, again, a blood test, imperfect blood test for nutrition, but yet, yet one that can be used, was the strongest predictor of complications. And Smith, we had just a couple of months ago out of our, our institution, looked at the muscle mass on a CAT scan. So patients get CAT scans before surgery, and we can actually look at some of the muscle mass, the so-called sarcopenia. Patients who had wasting, as measured by CAT scan, had a much higher rate of complications and even a trend toward worse survival. So we're really beginning to characterize the relationship between poor nutrition and poor outcomes. And we see that in our bladder cancer patients, we have a high-risk population undergoing a high-risk surgery. And we have a risk factor, a potentially modifiable risk factor, in the form of nutritional intervention. And at the end, when we talk about nutritional intervention, and Rachel will talk more about the, the ways of, of, of uh, uh, intervening, it's really minimal risk to improving some of the nutrition of a patient with certainly collateral benefits. One challenge we have is, what is the best way to assess the nutritional status in the office? So a patient walks in, how do we do it? Showing you a variety of say, blood tests, in full thickness. We'll talk a little bit about these nutritional indices, basically a, 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 a quick survey. Uh, but again, the problem is the assessment of nutritional status is not straightforward. It's not easy. There's no standard definitions. And again, our traditional markers really leave something to be desired. Ideally, what, what do we want in the ideal nutritional marker? Something that takes into account a patient's physiologic requirements. How much nutrition do they need? How, what are they taking in? 
what is their functional status. Are they running three miles a day or are they very, very sedentary? Those are all going to have different requirements and what is their body composition. And the ideal marker should be sensitive enough that it can detect alterations in nutrition early, specific enough that it, the changes that we're seeing are due to the nutritional factors, which in turn can correct the alteration. That is, can we, mod can we identify something and then modify that, that problem uh, to result in a more positive outcome? Just a quick word about nutritional indices. This is something that we, we often use. In the absence of gold standard on how to measure it, there's a variety of, of questionnaires that people have put forth. I'll show you just an example of one of them. This is the so-called MUST tool. So it's a one-page evaluation, five simple steps. And what we'll do is, as a patient's waiting in the waiting room, we'll give them this to fill out. It's often patient evaluated or driven, sometimes with a little help of the provider, in a very simple way of assessing the risk factors just from the, immediate, from the outset of the visit. Now, there's a lot of research being done here and elsewhere trying to find the more sophisticated measures, maybe a simple blood test, kind of like a pregnancy test. Can we draw the blood and say, yes, you are, no, you aren't? We're not there yet. So we're, as of yet, we're still using some of these indices and these imperfect tools to better, best identify malnutrition. But I think there's an important role for the, both the patient and the referring MD, whether it's a primary phys care physician or a urologist, as far as identifying patients who are malnutrition. Take the cystectomy patient. They're diagnosed, they're evaluated, they undergo imaging, maybe referred to a university hospital. That may take some time. Once they're there, maybe scheduling them from surgery can be a few weeks ahead of time. Maybe they undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy for three to four months. months. There's, a, there's a window of time and thereby an opportunity we have during that period of time not to stand by, but actually to evaluate, identify, and intervene from a nutritional standpoint. I think this is sometimes a lost opportunity. How do we do this? I'm going to leave this discussion up for, to Rachel to discuss more detail what types of nutritional supplementation. But I do want to kind of finish up with just a, a quick word about some other factors in addition to nutrition. How can we, again, utilize this window of opportunity from when the patient first walks in the doctor's office or is first diagnosed to when they undergo their more involved treatment? In addition to nutrition, there's smoking cessation. There's weight loss. So some patients, obese patients, are going to benefit themselves in their, their physiologic state with weight loss. And another very interesting aspect is the concept of what we call exercise or prehab. Often when patients undergo surgery or chemotherapy and we leave them somewhat debilitated, on the back end we, we do rehab. We try to build them up after their surgery, for example. This concept's a little different. This is not waiting until after, but beforehand, during this window of opportunity, can we take patients and build them up from, um, for physical optimization? I think, again, we have a window of opportunity. So in conclusion, I just want to uh, make note, again, that we, we're really now getting a, a better understanding of the importance of malnutrition as a significant risk factor in patients undergoing urologic surgery, and particularly bladder cancer surgery. There's a variety of ways and tools and sheets of paper we can use, simple, to identify this. But we need better studies and better investigation to identify that marker. How do we identify that better? and how do we supplement patients better so we can identify and intervene far, far earlier and make a bigger difference. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Pruthi. Um, now I will um, transfer over to Rachel Long. Can you hear me still? Yep. All right, so as I was saying, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, what you can do as a patient to help manage your symptoms. Um, and also prepare yourself for treatment and surgery, and then also nutrition post-surgery and post-treatment. I will also want to discuss with you on some of the um, guidelines regarding vitamin and mineral supplementation, and then post-treatment, also what you can do to help uh, with can, uh, prevention. So as we go to the next slide, um, Dr. Prusi already did speak about um, mul multiple factors that need to be taken into account when assessing nutritional status. And that is not just one factor or one tool. Um, 
So as he had mentioned, there are many factors, including your weight, um, body mass index. And I just wrote here in the slide that um, a normal body mass index would be between 18.9 and 24.5, although you know the, those lines can vary depending on age and what also your nutritional status has been most of your life, what your usual weight is, and also some other factors like he had mentioned prior to. There are also lots of tools that can be used, as he had mentioned. So one of the best recommendations I would have is to use these multiple factors to help assess, but also contact your registered dietitian. Most cancer centers do have them to help you come up with a appropriate, an appropriate nutrition assessment. Um, and one, one note to have in mind is that going into surgery or chemotherapy treatment, even if you are at a higher weight, or overweight with the, your BMI greater than 24.5, it may not be necessary for you to lose all the weight to get to that healthy weight, especially if you're going into surgery. Most importantly, it is to maintain your weight through your treatment, through your surgery, so that your body has enough nourishment to you know, stay healthy, to avoid skipped treatments, um, and to have the best possible outcome. And then after you finish your treatment, it is then more appropriate. You can work with your dietitian about uh, managing weight. Um, a couple other notes on this particular slide is that the nutrition status prior to surgery, as I had just mentioned, there are poor, poor outcomes um, and possibly longer recovery time with involuntary weight loss if you are malnourished prior to your treatment and pre-surgery. So even if and there's a possibility to gain a few pounds prior to your, to your surgery if you have a few weeks. Um, you can certainly work with your dietitian to, to find the best way to do that. And um, individual calorie, protein, and fluid requirements, um, they are variable per person. So again, meeting with a dietitian can certainly help clarify those specific needs um, and help you meet your goals. And then on to the next slide. Um, so some of the recommendations uh, that I will have for you going into your surgery include thinking about increasing your protein intake, which can help maintain lean body mass and also help promote wound healing. Um, so again, variable, but I can suggest for you um, thinking about maybe increasing to 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of your body weight. Um, and you don't have to be strict with um, counting protein counting calories, but for some of those people who are, who do find it helpful to, to have a measurable amount of protein, that can help. And then, but also meet with your dietitian to make sure that that works for you based on other um, comorbidities or health issues. And then also thinking about making sure that you hydrate properly, at least six to eight, if not more, glasses of water a day, and that should continue through your treatment. And um, you also may or may not need higher calories. and um, calorie provision can be directed by your dietitian as well, um, based off of if you've had a lot of weight loss prior to your treatment, um, for, or if you have maintained, or if you've been gaining anyway. So discussing that with your dietitian is, can be very beneficial. Post-surgery, um, you may be on a lower residue diet just for tolerating foods if you have been feeling nauseous. Um, and also to note that if you um, had an illo conduit, it's not necessary to have a um, modified diet. Just advance it, your diet as you tolerate based off of the, your, how you feel, how your stomach feels, um, up to a regular diet that does contain protein, um, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, all those things. And again, main goals of your treatment should be maintaining your weight, maintaining lean body mass through increased protein needs, if appropriate, and also adequate hydration, as I said before. One quick note I'd like to make here is I do have a lot of patients ask me about sugar and if they should, should or should not be consuming sugar, um, as a lot of the information online um, has kind of made this common statement that sugar feeds cancer. This is not the case exactly. Um, your body contains uh, cells, both healthy and cancerous, that need energy to, to thrive. And if you are eliminating forms of sugar or carbohydrate um, completely, that can starve your healthy cells, which need to function and need to help you heal. So it is best to have 
sugar or carbohydrates in the form of complex carbohydrates, such as beans and legumes, um, whole grain foods like wheat, uh, wheat bread, brown rice, quinoa, um, and lentils, as I said, beans. Um, instead of your, you know, your candy bars and your cakes and desserts. However, those, you know, you can have occasionally, but in general, more of the complex carbohydrates are better for you. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to provide you with a list because I was talking about protein and how important it was to help you heal. A list of proteins um, that you can incorporate into your diet. This is not the only list, but um, kind of covers the main foods that um, most people consume. So on the animal protein side, that includes you know your fish, your poultry, so chicken and turkey, any red meat, beef and pork, lamb, and then of course eggs and dairy. And I like to emphasize eggs and dairy with my patients because they tend to be well tolerated, especially the eggs. Um, especially so if you're like right out of surgery, eggs are kind of a good place to start, and also fish. Sometimes um, beef and pork tend to be harder to digest if your stomach's a little bit queasy or you're having some digestion issues. Um, so you can start with those. And then uh, for those of you who prefer more plant-based proteins, you can certainly get that um, protein from there, your lentils and your beans. Quinoa is a good option. Um, and then soy foods also have a great, are a great source of protein. Soy beans, soy milk, tofu, um, um, tempeh, for example. And then again, nuts and seeds um, in its raw form or in like nut butters, for example, peanut butter and almond butter. Okay. And then um, next slide, I want to give you a little bit more insight into some of the symptoms and some tips on managing these symptoms. Now, there's a lot of symptoms written on this list. Um, a lot of them I gathered from the chemotherapies that um, bladder cancer patients most commonly receive. And the top symptoms that, that, are, um, that come up will be nausea and vomiting, and generally the mouth and the diarrhea. Then others can experience the decreased appetite, loss of appetite, increased thirst, weight gain, um, stomach pain, and then dry mouth. So just um, because we don't have too much time, I want to just go over the, the major ones, which is the, the nausea and the vomiting, give you some tips here. Um, you want to generally follow a lower residue diet, meaning some things that would sit less in your, lighter in your stomach, lower fiber, lower fat. Um, so what might be more appropriate if you are experiencing lots of nausea and vomiting would be some plain rice-based foods like um, plain white rice, mashed potatoes, um, dry crackers can usually work, broth like chicken noodle soup is, is usually a good, good bet. Um, to start with, um, and then also note that it's important to try to have um, smaller, more frequent meals. So not even meals, you can call them snacks, but eating at least, you know, every three hours or so, two, three hours, so that would have you eating like six times a day so that you're not filling your stomach with a lot of food, but kind of eating, grazing um, in that way. And then um, also just, you know, making sure they eat in a very calm environment. So Try to have, you know, TVs off, kind of focus on your meal, sit up right, and um, not a lot of sounds and people around just kind of to allow you to focus on how you're eating. And then just um, with mouth sores, which can arise from some of the treatments, um, making sure to have good oral hygiene is key. So making sure to keep your mouth clean, brush your, brush your teeth even more than twice a day, rinse your mouth, and sometimes I recommend um, like a baking soda with warm water and a little bit of salt rinse can help. Um, even prevent the onset of them sooner. But um, when if they do come, a couple other things: using a straw to help divert um, the fluids or food uh, aside or around where the sores are can help. And then avoiding citrusy or acidic foods, so avoiding orange juice, tomato-based products, lemon, any of those foods, and spicy foods, of course, um, can help. Things that are softer. That have more, that are more moist, or have sauces on top, gravies can help um, with lessening the severity of the pain. Um, and then, some also thinking about temperature, so choosing colder foods can help too. Uh, diarrhea, and I'll go over diarrhea as well. Diarrhea can be managed by um, avoiding uh, lots of insoluble fiber, meaning the kind of roughage. So you would find in, like, for example, an apple with the skin or raw vegetables like broccoli. Um, you would probably want to stay with um, 
similar to the foods that I would suggest we're not even vomiting, actually. Low residue, bland, mashed potatoes, white rice, broth um, on those, that, those ends. Um, and then the small frequent meals also help there. And then if the following, the rest of the symptoms, if anybody has questions specifically at the end of the, the discussion, I'd be more than happy to go over those um, as well. And then um, going into the next slide, I have just a couple points about vitamin and mineral supplementation. Um, it is best actually to avoid taking any like high dose or just any specific vitamin or mineral supplements unless you're deficient or unless your doctor um, has recommended it for you. That being because certain vitamins, well, the vitamin industry is actually isn't regulated by the FDA, so a lot of times we don't really know that much about how certain vitamins can interact with your chemotherapy um, or your other treatments that you receive. Um, sometimes certain vitamins can act as um, potent antioxidants, and which can, in theory, be protective against um, your cells, as, as we know antioxidants are. However, if you're trying to get uh, chemotherapy or cancer treatment that's trying to take and get rid of the bad cancer cells, sometimes these vitamins and minerals can be more protective to the cells and, and make the treatment less effective. Um, so talk to your doctor, talk to your dietitian if you do have questions about supplements. Some of them, you know, calcium, vitamin D, a lot of times they're okay with you taking, but again, talk to your healthcare professional about that. And then lastly, um, I have a couple of slides I'll just go through pretty quickly, but just following treatment in terms of like can cancer prevention, um, uh, choosing a healthy diet that um, with physical activity is, is the best um, recommendation to help prevent reoccurrence. Um, and I did include um, kind of, there's not one specific food that prevents cancer, but the American Institute of Cancer Research has been conducting research on certain foods to help give us a better understanding of, you know, what foods may be more beneficial. And so this list here is kind of their ongoing list of foods, and you can find more on their website um, that have been found to have certain properties that are beneficial to preventing cancer, not bladder in specific, but in general cancer prevention. And as you can see that these are all mostly plant, well, they are all plant-based. So um, in summary, plant-based foods would be recommended um, over eating a heavily animal-based diet. And then the last couple of slides um, are the AICR cancer prevention recommendations. Um, and, you know, be as lean as possible, as we talked about earlier, without being underweight, include physical activity, avoid sugary drinks, and include more vegetables and fruits. Um, and then the last slide, would be um, limiting consumption of you know, red, red meat, the beef, lamb, and pork, and then limiting alcohol intake, um, no more than two drinks a day for men, no more than one for women, but less is better, and then limiting consumption of salt, and then um, avoiding use, the use of high amounts of supplements to protect against cancer. And then I just gave you some references or some resources on the, on the last slide so you can look into a little bit more. And um, that should be it. All right. Well, thank you, Rachel. Um, now we'll start taking um, questions. And once again, a lot of people have already typed in their questions on that little box on the bottom right-hand side. But if you haven't, you do have a question, please do so. And I'll read them out loud, and the panelists will respond. Um, okay. Um, for the first question, I'm going to direct this to Dr. Pruthi. Um, it's a two-part one. What supplements or vitamins should be avoided by those with bladder cancer, and which should be used frequently? Do you have specific recommendations like curcumin, green tea, vitamin E, selenium? Yes, uh, you know, it, that's a good question. And the impact, you know, bladder cancer is interesting because it's one of the first cancers that's been associated with environmental toxins and carcinogens. So we know what's out there and what we take in can affect bladder cancer. So it's, it's, a, it's a logical step to say, how does diet play a role either in causing or curing my bladder cancer? Over the years, there's been a lot of discussion to this point of the role of nutrition, uh, studies back and forth looking at the impact of soy, garlic, cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli have been studied quite a bit. 
and fruits and vegetables. Uh, my take on on that from a dietary standpoint, and, and thereby supplement with with, vitamin, with some of the vitamins are. When you look at the data, there's a lot of reports, and when people have tried to analyze the data in bladder cancer, and I think, I think you, the next webinar will actually get into this in a little bit more detail, that these, these studies don't really pan out with anything too obvious. So there's no magic answer to go to your nutrition, you know, your GNC or your, your pharmacy and say, I'm going to load up on vitamin E, and that's going to make the difference, or selenium, and that's going to make the difference. And we've, we've actually seen seen that that concept, prostate cancer actually, uh, in that area, had a very interesting study of vitamin E and selenium that a lot of enthusiasm, and it had a 32,000 patient study. And at the end of the study, actually it was halted mid-study, there was no difference seen. So when we begin to evaluate these vitamins in more detail, we lose some of the, the robustness of what they show. Long answer to your question to say, I, I don't think that there's anything, and I think Rachel touched on this, that I would necessarily avoid. In addition, though, I would be careful about taking super high doses of anything. Uh, it, it tends to be sort of in, in America our, our thoughts that if 40 units of vitamin E are good, 400 units and 4,000 units must be better. And that's and Rachel can answer this too. That's really often not the case. So I advocate for my patients broadly. A, a, a multivitamin day is fine. I mean, uh, as, as a supplement, they don't need to take high doses of supplements for anything. Have a well-balanced diet. They don't need to avoid meat at every corner, but don't overtake that. They can have a nice, well-balanced diet. And exercise and activity. Basically, in my, in my view, a heart-friendly diet is often a cancer-friendly diet as well, uh, without any more specific high levels of anything. And, and Rachel, do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Um. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Actually, I, I do agree 100%. Um, just also wanting to comment that if you do get a multivitamin, to make sure to pay attention to the label and look at the percent daily value of the nutrients listed on the, the multivitamin, making sure that it's not over 100% of your daily value um, can be important because a lot of the general multivitamins that you get at like a natural food store, like Whole Foods, can, some of them can tend to have you know, 2,000 to 4,000 percent more than what's recommended. Uh, Oncovite is a, a multivitamin that has been put to get constructed for bladder cancer and bladder cancer patients. The most <laughs> of the, the, the what constitutes Oncovite is available in the normal vi multivitamin, and as Rachel says, 100 percent intake is fine. I don't recommend patients necessarily go out and spend extra money and buy, buy Oncovite. I'm not sure that the data is is so strong that it makes any difference. And um, I also wanted to just put in a couple two cents there that food is going to be the most bioavailable to your body. So for you to for an individual to get nutrients from food sources instead of vitamins, um, your body will be able to metabolize them and use them more effectively than a certain dose coming from a pill. Does that make sense? All right, well, thank you. Um, for the next question, I'll direct this one to Rachel. Um, the person asked, are milk and yogurt advisable if one has bladder cancer? I know we are supposed to avoid sugars like fructose and sucrose. I think you mentioned sugars a little bit. When you said yeah, um, I did talk about that a little bit. I'll reemphasize that um, any any kind of food, because there's, there's sugar naturally in fruit. Um, any kind of fruit that we consume. There are sugars naturally in milk and yogurt, um, but they are a little bit more complex. So, um, so as I said before, the, the concept or the myth that people hear is that sugar feeds cancer. And to reiterate that um, your body does require nutrition, your um, carbohydrates, your healthy cells, healthy body cells, and your cancer cells do require energy. But limiting that or completely eliminating carbohydrates or sugars from your diet um, does not necessarily benefit your body and, and does not necessarily help you heal because your body does need nutrition. Primary, the primary source of energy for your body is carbohydrate over protein, over fat. So making sure to have some form of a healthy carbohydrate that comes from something that's complex, like um, yogurt and milk, is just fine. Um, 
but also coming from, for example, the brown rice, quinoa, the, the beans, the barley, the oatmeal, um, just those kinds of foods, they also carry a lot of other healthy benefits like fiber um, that you can get other than just having something like, like soda that just is sugar. There's, there's uh, no, no benefit to having, there's no nutrition in the, the, those kinds of foods. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that question. All right, well, thank you. Um, for the next question, I'll direct this one to Dr. Pruthi. Um, the person asked, what is the best liquid to drink and the best food to eat to keep the bladder lining clean? You know, there's, again, I, I can't tell you that there is some, uh, a single drink or, or food substances that is going to keep it clean and make the difference and protect from, from cancer development. What we do know with regard to some fluid intake is there have been some associations of incre increased water intake, so it's more of a hydration aspect, and some uh, protective effects to bladder cancer. Again, not very well understood, but there are those associations. What that intake is, however, is you know what, what you're hydrating yourself with doesn't seem to matter, and I think some of the associations have really been primarily with water. So short answer is if you're going to, you know, I think it's important to stay hydrated. Staying hydrated, there's nothing better than to stay hydrated with water. You know, we, there's so many things now on the on the store shelves that you can buy to hydrate yourself. And if you if you look in the water section, there's 30 different types of water. So life is getting kind of complicated, but I don't think it needs to be that complicated. I think staying hydrated, staying hydrated with water is fine. And and with that said, I don't think you need to overhydrate yourself either. I have some patients who come in and and really kind of take this very, very seriously and are overhydrating themselves to the point that they're using the bathroom every, you know, hour. You know, everything I think within moderation, everything within reason, um, it really is a, a multi-pronged approach to bladder cancer, which relates to diet, which relates to lifestyle, which relates to smoking cessation and other aspects too. But drinking water would be my recommendation. All right, well, thank you. Um, for the next question, I'll direct this one to Rachel. Is there value in taking cranberry supplements? Um, I think, based on my knowledge of taking cranberry supplements, I haven't read anything specifically in regards to bladder cancer. I think the I've read about that in terms of um, making your urine a little bit more acidic. But in terms of preventing or um, helping, you know, your symptom management during your chemotherapy, there, I'm not aware of any um, value in it. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Cruz has any comments on that. Yeah, it, 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 as you said, acidifies the urine. Some, it's been long <coughs> taken with effect, with, with favorable effect in patients with a recurrent urinary tract infection by altering the pH of the urine. Effects in bladder cancer, so, so yes, perhaps in urinary tract, recurrent urinary tract infection patients, as far as bladder cancer, no, there's, there's no uh, uh, significant association. They're very high in antioxidants. So again, some people with bladder cancer and other cancers have, have looked to cranberries and other kind of high antioxidant subs, you know, fruits and, and, uh, and vitamins. But again, in and of itself, I don't think it, there's, there's uh, um, probably not any harm, but I can't tell you that there's a significant or dramatic benefit. All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, for the next question, I'll direct this one to Dr. Pruthi. Um, since sometimes having an ileal conduit means that vitamin B12 is not absorbed, what should we do? So you, you, you bring up a very good and sophisticated question in addressing the concept of B12 absorption in the body. So the majority of our B12 is absorbed in our terminal ileum, so the very end of the, the, the ileum, right before it plugs into our colon. So our small bowel, the part of the small bowel is the ileum, the end of it of the small bowel is the ileum, right before it plugs into the colon. As a surgical principle, we leave the, the, the last eight inches or so, uh, at least you know five to eight inches of the ileum, as a surgical principle for the, for the reasons of, number one, preserving that portion of the ileum that is involved in B12 absorption, that part of the ileum is also important in bile acid absorption. So 
it is it is a surgical routine that you do not take that se segment of the ileum, and and so for most patients, what I'm getting at should not have problems with B12 absorption with an ileal conduit. With that said, it can happen, and in fact, in patients with continent diversions, for example, the Indiana pouch does take that segment of the ileum, and they do fall prey to some problems with low B12 absorption. Those patients should be, you know, as part of their follow-up with, with, their, with their surgeon and physician, should be being evaluated for that with the routine blood tests that are obtained. The, the, the blood counts, for example, can show for B12 deficiency. In fact, you can measure for that now. And there's actually oral supplementation for B12. There's shots, and there's also oral supplementation for that. Rachel, any other thoughts on uh, B12, uh, enhancing B12 intake? <laughs> yeah, you covered most of it. <laughs> Okay. That sounds good. Great. Um, great. All right. Um, next question I'll direct to Rachel. Can you comment on B17 supplements? Mm, that is a, that is even more of a complex question. Um, so I would probably mm, B17 specifically. I don't really have any thoughts on that in terms of bladder cancer and treatment, uh, other more no more than what uh, Dr. Bruzzi had mentioned in relation to the B12. So I'll have to defer to Dr. Bruzzi if he has any thoughts on specifically B17. Yeah, it, it's you know I I I I think there's some dis dispute. Is it, are you talking about like Laetrile kind of compounds? Because there there's also this concept of of you know, is B seventeen layer? I mean, there, there's some controversy in that, and I'll, I'll I'll admit not knowing a lot about that. I'll tell you though, in understanding bladder cancer and having knowledge on factors which can protect and factors which may put patients at risk for bladder cancer, I, I don't know of any association of layetrils or B seventeen. Okay, and I forgot this person who um who asked the question also said that it's um, used a lot more in Europe and Latin South America. Um, I mean, probably yeah. given that there isn't that much, you know, evidence here or use in the support in the states, which is probably need more more studies to be conducted on it to give give any good advice on that. Okay. Um, for the next question, I'll direct to Dr. Prusi. That person says, "My husband is having a radical cystectomy um, later this month. Can he continue to take um, glucosamine chondroitin for joint pain?" The answer is yes. There's no, there's no concerns or limitations. There's no effects on bleeding. I mean, we often worry as surgeons about fat, uh, even supplements, but medications that can affect bleeding, obviously, with surgery. There's no effects to that at all. Um, just a quick comment to that. I'd, I'd, I'd tell them good luck with that. And, and um, uh, you know, I, I think that all the things we talked about today and, and you, you know, staying fit, staying active, I think is important, the nutritional aspect. Staying positive, a positive frame of mind is very, very important. You have a lot of comfort and faith in your providers. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relationship that you have. It's not somebody doing something to you or you being the victim. It's, it's, it's you doing it together. You obviously have a good support system because, you know, the, the, your wife is, is on the line too. And all of those things are very, very important as patients recover. One quick comment uh, I would make that we've done from a nutritional standpoint also with patients undergoing surgery. It was, it was typical that patients about to undergo surgery, we would basically starve them. Not, nothing to eat or drink for two days before surgery, gallon of go lightly to clean out their bowels, after surgery basically not feed them for days. And we've gone the other direction completely. We actually will pe feed patients regular food up until midnight the night before surgery. There's even some discussion of should patients get some other carbohydrates even the morning of surgery. We haven't because of anesthesia reasons, we haven't done that quite yet, but we, we feed patients right until surgery. They have no bowel preparation at all. It's not needed. And that way, when they come in for surgery, they're not in a basically a starvation mode. They've been eating until midnight. They're fluid-wise, they're much more hydrated because they haven't had this kind of cathartic effect with go lightly or bowel cleansers. And at the end of the day, this has been shown to make no difference with surgery at all. So patients come in much more fit, much feel, feeling much better, much better hydrated. And then on the tail end of it, we've been much more aggressive about restarting a patient's diet. 
We used to wait till patients' bowels would wake up and pass gas and bowel movements. And in fact, we don't do that anymore. We kind of what we call fast track them and start giving them something to drink the day after surgery. And in fact, we've not run into any problems and, and patients seem to do actually much better. And again, gets them back on nutritional supplementation. There's no better nutritional supplementation than taking your own intake. All right. Well, it looks like we have time for just about uh, one more question. Um, I'll direct this to Rachel. Should a patient take vitamin C or antioxidant supplements during chemotherapy? Great question. And uh, as we said from previously, um, we do not recommend any kind of high-dose antioxidant vitamin or herbal supplements during chemotherapy. Um, and again, that would be because um, it's potential to help uh, uh, emit more of a protective uh, effect on your body and your cells, including the cancer cells, which the chemotherapies are trying to work against to work um, to get rid of. So um, it is not it's perfectly normal, um, perfectly okay to incorporate foods that have those vitamins and antioxidants from the food sources, but um, recommended to avoid any actual pill, supplement extract that um, would contain more antioxidants. Even um, like green tea I've had patients asking about and turmeric. Um, and certainly include those in, you know, your spices, um, drinking green tea, things like that in moderation, of course. Um, but the, I would, would recommend um, to avoid the pill supplements or any kind of high dose, as I said earlier. Can, can I make one other comment too? I just, I just, we haven't t talked too much about this in particular, but one of the things I mentioned about, you know, and with the last question, and I, I'm going to go a little bit on it uh, off topic here, but we talked about sort of after surgery and feeding and the recovery of that. And again, the GI tract and the recovery of the GI tract function is often the rate limiting step for patients' recovery, leaving the hospital and, and, and getting on their feet. And even if the case goes perfectly, a lot of times patients, and Rachel has seen this, I'm sure, will be up and down for four weeks, six weeks while their bowels are kind of readjusting. Antibiotics, anesthesia, a lot of things can contribute to this. We've moved away from, again, this bowel cleansing and, and, and the heavy use of antibiotics, which has had some positive effects. One thing I find is often after surgery, patients' GI tract flora, the bacteria that normally is in there, kind of gets wiped out, and they struggle with that. And some of the problems are their GI tract kind of refiguring out what, what back, what's good bacteria and bad bacteria. And we hear about some bad bacteria that can cause problems. To that point, um, I found that patients, and, and it's basically patients taught me this uh, when they reported back that often after surgery, especially if you had prolonged antibiotics, probiotics can be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. That it settles out their GI tract, they can all of a sudden eat a little more, it puts that good bacterial flora in there, and they really turn around pretty well. Something to consider also in this process is the use of probiotics. Yeah. That's a great point. I, I, I agree fully, and I find that patients um, tend to have less, if they have, you know, loose looser stools, post-treatment, post uh, post-surgery, it seems to help um, with to them to tolerate more, more of the food and get back on track um, more rapidly. All right, well, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up as well. Um, well, I'd like to say thank you to both of our speakers tonight, Dr. Raj Prufi and Rachel Wong. Um, and as you can see on the screen, we'll have our second webinar in this series on nutrition and bladder cancer on Thursday, May 29th on debunking myths. We also have been recording this webinar, and it will be available on the Beacon website um, within the next two weeks. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and have a great evening. All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.